Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the last Sunday of our liturgical church year. Uh, we leave the Gospel of Mark, which I have just enjoyed so much over the last liturgical year. And we begin the Gospel of Luke. And so for the next year, that will be our emphasis in our Gospel lessons. And today, as we finish that liturgical church year, we celebrate Christ the King Sunday today. And where Jesus proclaims, my kingdom is not from this world. Uh, and we welcome back Dave Rye from Billings uh, of uh, Channel 8 News Anchor fame and now uh, a lay pastoral associate. Uh, and he has been here several times. We've always enjoyed preaching. So next Sunday is the beginning of the Advent season. And we will see the, uh, the Advent wreath up here and we will begin that quiet period before our Christmas uh, uh, festival time. And we will be switching to year C in the lectionary, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we welcome our visitors today, Matt and his family with Irene and Ken. And we also have some special visitors and I'm going to call on Judy because Judy got a chance to talk with them by phones. We so. have our visitors, Lynn Oliver and her friend Stacy. See, I was awfully close to forgetting all that. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn and I have spoken on the phone, and, and thank you, Irene, for, for reaching out there. Um, Lynn's husband is in the hospital in Columbus. His name is Douglas, and we'd like to keep Douglas in our prayers since he's going through that time. And I would like to also welcome uh, my daughter, Deb, and her husband, Michael, and their three children. And I have to say the greatest compliment of any mother is to be confused with her daughters. And Mike asked me which one was the mother, and that was very nice. <laughs> Welcome from Meridian, Colorado, Idaho. Uh, today we have a, in addition to our regular offering, which is in the plates, either in the uh, parish hall or in the narthex, uh, we have a special offering that we're going to take, which just involves your pocket change. And hopefully you brought lots of pocket change because we're going to, John is going to, well, the Johns are going to take up an offering with noisy tin cans, and we throw our change in it and make as much noise as possible, and that noisy offering is going to support the Seeds of Kindness program uh, for St. John's Ministries. And Thale, do you want to say something about Seeds of Kindness? Yes. And along with that, we're going to get Mr. Pockets going again. And um, the money that goes into Mr. Pockets will also go to St. John's, Seed the Kindness. And Seed the Kindness goes towards, you know, St. John's never, ever puts, when they run out of money, they are not put out. They are kept there in St. John's. And um, Seeds of Kindness helps with that. And also uh, the employees, and the employees have a special donation that they do too in case someone in their group uh, has a need. But um, Seeds of Kindness also goes their way if they are in need of something. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I can't say enough good about and St. Pastor John's. And Pastor Tom but Schlatterback is going to be back here in a yes. couple of weeks. And we will probably repeat the noisy offering 
when he is here. So yeah. uh, support yeah. them with generosity. And there's a folder on Mr. Pocket that explains more about Seeds of Kindness if you want to read that. So thank, thank you, you for anything that you do there. And Steve, uh, also, we will accept currency, so if you got <laughs> Okay, that reminds me of one more. Thank you, John. If you, if you give a check in Mr. Pockets or the Noisy Offering, make it out to Emmanuel so that our church gets credit for it at, we're one of the sponsoring churches at St. John's. And one of the founding churches of St. John's. Yes. So if you just make it out to Emmanuel and then put uh, for seeds of kindness. Thank you. Great. Important announcement for the choir. We have a uh, the annual choral Christmas uh, service on the 19th of December, and we have a lot of preparation to do. And we have switched our choir practice time to Monday at 7 p.m. So that is tomorrow at 7 p.m. choir practice. Do you want to add anything? We can to still that? use more singers. It's still a nice time, time to join us when we're going into Christmas music. So. <clears throat> All right, and then Wednesday there is Faith, Fun, and Fellowship. After oh, this Wednesday there is no no because they are dismissed from school for Thanksgiving break. Got gotcha. you. Okay. So that will resume the following Wednesday. All right. I was going to say. Um, and next Sunday, Advent 1, we'll be lighting our first candle and uh, Bible study, don't forget, is at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. So any other announcements that I missed? All right. Sandy, what do you have for us for your prelude? Come ye faithful, raise the strain, and it's number 363 in the hymnal, so you'll recognize it. All right, so let's gather our hearts and minds in preparation for worship.
have long memories. It has been 21 years now. Uh, I picked out a necktie this morning. It has both grizzly and bobcat colors in it. Uh, the day after the brawl of the wild, that the healing and the reconciling begin. <laughs> Let us begin our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess, we confess that we are captives to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you to our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a lay pastoral associate of the Montana Synod of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gathering him, come thou Almighty King, number 408, verses 1 and 4.
Grant that all the people of the earth, now divided by the power of sin, may be united by the glorious and gentle rule of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I came into the world to testify to the truth. 
Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I have a small radio in the bathroom where I spend my morning ritual of shaving and brushing my teeth. And as I was doing it this morning, I heard the song Eleanor Rigby from the 1960s by the Beatles. And it has, uh, it takes me back to my disc jockey days, uh, which I was doing in my 20s until I reluctantly decided that I should probably grow up sometime. So then I ended up doing other things after that. Anyway, one of the verses of the song has the words, Father Mackenzie writing this word to the sermon that no one will hear. And I thought, boy, I hope that doesn't how, I hope that isn't how this one turns out <laughs> this morning. We'll see. So anyway, uh, I wrote it. I hope you'll hear it. And if you mentally tune me out, I guess I won't know it, but I hope you won't. Take you back 25 years. Queen Elizabeth II took a tour of some American cities about 25 years ago. And I can't remember why the tour included Sheridan, Wyoming, but it did for some reason. I think she has a, a distant blood relative living in the Sheridan area. What I remember most about it, though, was when the Queen stopped in Chicago, which was after her trip to Sheridan, and she visited a poverty-stricken part of the inner city of Chicago, which included a soup kitchen for the homeless. And the woman who ran the shelter greeted the Queen the same way she greeted all the other new arrivals. She hugged her. Well, Chicago civic leaders and especially members of the Queen's entourage were shocked and appalled. You don't hug the Queen. Nobody hugs the Queen, except maybe Prince Philip. And until his death a few months ago at the age of 99, even he was supposed to walk one step behind her whenever they were out in public. No one even touches the Queen's skin. When she's in a reception line shaking hands, she keeps her gloves on. You see, members of royalty aren't supposed to live as you and I do. They're special. They're above the rules that apply to regular human beings. The feeling goes back as far as antiquity. Well, why did hundreds of thousands of slaves, for example, work on building the Egyptian pyramids so that the pharaoh at the time, whoever he happened to be, would have a blissful afterlife? Never mind the afterlives of the hundreds of thousands of workers. They didn't matter. Only the pharaoh mattered. The emperors of Rome had the power of life and death over fallen fighters at the gladiator contests. They even had the power of death over people who had momentarily irritated them. Why did the Roman Empire suddenly become Christian nearly 400 years after the earthly preachings of Jesus? Well, that was because Emperor Constantine decreed that it should after he had a dream, seeing a vision of the cross, and then he won a battle. The vision with the cross had the Latin words in hulk signo win case, which translated to our language means in this sign you will conquer. Have you heard that phrase before, in hulk signo win case? Have you thought maybe where you've seen that? I'll tell you, it's on the pack of a <laughs> it's on the front of a pack of Palmo cigarettes. <laughs> I suppose it ought to, I don't know why they have that, but I suppose that we really ought to say, you know, by this sign you shall die younger than you otherwise would. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's where you see that slogan now. And I hope you won't rush out and buy a pack of palm oil just to see if I'm right. <laughs> Take my word for it. Well, after Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg and started the Protestant Reformation, Germany became split. There was no supreme German government per se back then just a bunch of individual German states with each one having a ruler. Some of the rulers went along with Luther's thinking and some of them didn't. Therefore, some German states were Catholic and some were Lutheran. Lay people didn't have the right to decide what they believed. That was up to the ruler. Yeah, kings and queens have usually lived by different rules than anybody else. A scene in the Jack Lemmon, Tony Curtis movie of about 1965 called The Great Race probably wasn't far from the truth. When they were in Russia, and something made the Tsar laugh, he would do this as a command for everybody else to laugh along with him. Ha, ha, ha. And if he didn't do that gesture, nobody laughed. 
and they dutifully laughed if he gave the gesture. Well, I suppose it's human nature, or at least the nature of too many humans, to want power or control over the lives of other people. Sometimes it's necessary, especially in the case, say, of parents having control over their children. But once we're adults, well, it seems awfully arbitrary. And if we can't be kings, the secondary desire is to be part of an in-crowd. I think back now with some regret to my time in a college fraternity, we didn't allow everybody who wanted to join to join. We excluded some people because they weren't cool enough. They wouldn't have helped our image on the campus. Even in high school, I belonged to a club like that, one which excluded certain people. And at the time, I didn't think much about the feelings of those who were left out. I was only glad that I had been included. Neither in college nor in high school did I ever personally blackball anybody, anybody who wanted to join, but I also didn't raise any fuss when somebody else did the blackballing in my place, to which I now say, shame on me. Both of the 2004 major party nominees for president, George W. Bush and John Kerry, were members of Skull and Bones at Yale. That's an exclusive group, one which a few members, a few people were allowed in and not very many. So Yale, already being an exclusive college, had this even more exclusive group called Skull and Bones. And I hope both Kerry and Bush are ashamed of themselves for having belonged to it, but I don't know if they are. C.S. Lewis referred to this desire of exclusivity as the inner ring. It's the desire to be one of the few who have all the inside information, one of the few who are accepted. Even Christianity can fall prey to this desire for both power and prestige and the status of being an insider. Early in the existence of our faith, there were people known as the Gnostics. Gnosticism meant special information. The Gnostics had several different branches but all of them claim to have inside information not available to the average Christian. Ultimately, the real church ruled out their so-called inside information and justly called it heresy. And the Gnostics were drummed out and gradually faded away. C.S. Lewis wrote in his words, of all the passions, the passion for the inner ring is skillful in making a man who is not yet a very bad man do very bad things. I mention all that I've mentioned because today, as Steve mentioned, is Christ the King Sunday. It's the final Sunday of the church year. Next Sunday will be the beginning of Advent, when we celebrate the conception of the human Jesus by the Holy Spirit, leading up to his earthly birth as a helpless infant. 52 Sundays from now will be another Christ the King Sunday, when we acknowledge Jesus as the ultimate king, and in fact, the only real one. What kind of king was this, though? He broke all the rules for being a king. He didn't live his earthly life in splendor. He lived in poverty, born in a stinky stable. He didn't want power over people except to heal them, both physically and spiritually. He didn't want people to fear him. He wanted them to love him, as he loved them. And, of course, he was willing to suffer the excruciating death of a common criminal only even though he was the only person ever to walk this earth who was totally without sin. I think it's spiritually healthy that we at Emmanuel Lutheran Church worship simply in a relatively small group, in this relatively small space. I compare it in my mind to the hugeness and majesty of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, with the cardinals and the pope dressed in mighty ornate clothing and headgear. That's the church getting, in my judgment, a little bit too big for its bridges, don't you think? That seems like the opposite of how our master and savior made his way through the world. I think Jesus is present at services at St. Peter's Basilica with several thousand people present, but he is just as present, and I hope just as pleased, with the small number who gather here at Emmanuel Lutheran in little old Sorky, Montana. We are just as blessed, and maybe more so, as those several thousand. Earthly kings seem exempt from tough times. We non-royal people are more than familiar with tough times. We've all gone through them, or we're going through them now, or we will go through them in the future. All three lessons today concern ourselves with dealing with tough times. The lesson from Daniel was from when the Israelites were captives of the Persians, 
forced to live the lives of slaves in a foreign land. <laughs> Daniel's message from God was, this won't last forever. The verses from Revelation tell us of the ultimate triumph of Jesus and of godly persons over the cruelties and sins of this world, a triumph in which each of us will share. And the verses from the Gospel of John tell the kind of king Jesus is, one whose mission is to love and serve. What kind of nonsense is that? Pilate is thinking, what kind of nonsense is loving and serving for a royal person? Kings want power. If there's any serving to be done, kings and rulers are supposed to be on the receiving end of it, not the giving end of it. All three lessons remind us that life is often difficult. Sometimes it seems the difficulties will never end. And in this earthly life that we are each now living, they probably won't. Solve some difficulties and new ones will present themselves. But just as our earthly lives won't last beyond a certain number of years, neither will the tough times. Ultimately, God's reign will overcome them. If I say, live your life as happily and as gratefully as possible, and don't worry about power or prestige, I suppose I'm saying, do your best to go against your basic human nature. Well, I'm saying it anyway. It's an especially good time to say it, since we will observe Thanksgiving Day four days from now. In truth, life, even with its difficulties, is an incredible gift, however long our earthly lives turn out to be. Every day becomes much, much better if we begin and end it in the spirit of thanksgiving. I have said before, and I think it every day, every day is Christmas, and therefore every day ought to be thanksgiving. Well, let me get back to the concept of the inner ring. People who strive to be part of an exclusive group remain unhappy. Either they're unhappy because they're not in it, or that they worry some about someday no longer being a part of it, or because they expected that being in it would make them happy, and it didn't. Lewis writes, again quoting him, if in your spare time you can start simply with the people you like, you will find that you have come unawares to a real inside, that you are indeed snug and safe at the center of something which, if seen from the outside, would look exactly like an inner ring. But the difference is that its secrecy is accidental and its exclusiveness is a byproduct. For it is only four or five people who like one another meeting together to do the things they like. This is friendship. It causes perhaps half of all the happiness in the world and no inner ringer can ever have it. And that is why we as Christians look for opportunities not to exclude those who are not of our faith, but to include them and to make them part of us. It will make us happier by making them happier. The only true king is the one who made each of us and who made the world. His kingdom is forever. His kingdom will have no end. And if we choose to follow him, neither will we. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Turn number 430. <laughs>
Apostles' Creed on page 105. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in you, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of the Let us pray for the whole people of God and the Church in Christ Jesus. Begin this morning by telling us out loud or silently the specific people for whom you pray, which would include those who are listed in today's bulletin. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world, including the change that this church is anticipating in the near future. Hear us now as we pray for the church of the world and everyone in need. God, you sent your son Jesus to testify to the truth. We pray for preachers, missionaries, evangelists, and teachers who carry your forgiveness and love to the world. Fill their words and actions with compassion and kindness so that your truth will shine. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you sent your son Jesus to, be, to liberate all of creation. <coughs> we pray for all living things, longing for the freedom to flourish, from ancient trees and wild grasses to endangered animals and rare insects. Give human beings compassionate hearts to care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, you sent your son Jesus to lead us into the way of peace. Direct the members of international alliances in choosing a nonviolent path toward the future. Give them the humility and wisdom to make just decisions to benefit all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, you sent your son Jesus to make us into your own people. Set free and serve you. We pray for others, for people who serve the well-being of others, especially ministries in our community. And we pray for those who were driven from their homes near Absurdi in the past week by fire danger. Renew them in your work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, you sent your son Jesus to rule in all times and places. We pray for the friends of our congregation who are unable to join our worship in person and for all who are sick and suffering. Join their prayers with ours and unite them with us in the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our prayers. prayers. God, you sent your son Jesus to be our beginning and our ending. We give thanks for those whose lives have given us a glimpse of Jesus' reign of justice and peace. Empower us to join their witness. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We share God's peace with one another.
conditional benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Led on by the saints before us, go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.